Hey girl, let's talk crime. Today we're going to be discussing the murder of 15 year old Kirsten Costas. So uh, there is a movie that was made in the 90s called Death of a Cheerleader. Um, it has also been called A Friend to Die For and that movie is about this tragic case. A lot of times people ask me where you can find or watch the movie and this movie you can find on YouTube. Uh, just type in Death of a Cheerleader and you can watch it for free. Kirsten Costas was born on July 23rd, 1968 and she lived in Orinda, California with her parents Arthur and Beret as well as her younger brother Pete. So her father, Arthur, was an executive um, of a company and he made enough money that uh, her mother, Beret, was able to stay home and uh, take care of the home, take care of the children. So they lived in a really, really nice neighborhood, like you had to have money to live here. And according to her parents, she was like outgoing. She was very popular amongst her peers. She was sarcastic. She just had like a lot of energy, a lot of life. She was clearly um, a really pretty girl. And um, a lot of the boys, you know, she was a big hit with the boys. She always um, was being asked out and things of that nature, but she really didn't date. She was on the cheerleading team. She played soccer, swim. Um, she was just like big dog around the high school. So Kirsten was also a part of a like sorority light group called the Baba Links. So this group was like a volunteer group, but it was like a big deal. And there was another girl that was a part of that group as well. And her name was Bernadette Prati. Now Bernadette lived in the same neighborhood, um, in the same area as Kirsten did. However, um, they didn't have like a lot of money for the extra, for the excess. So whereas Kirsten's family, you know, were sending her off the cheerleading camp and they did, you know, really uh, awesome family vacations and she wore the best clothes. Bernadette's family lived in this neighborhood. So they did have enough and they lived comfortably, but they didn't have excess. So, so she wore clothes that were hand-me-downs and she wasn't able to, uh, you know, go to like the cheer camps and do a lot of the other things that required money. However, even though they were in the same groups, she and Kirsten were not friends and that did not sit well with Bernadette. Bernadette wanted more. She wanted to be like Kirsten. She wanted Kirsten's life. So she had come up with this plan. On June 22nd, 1984, Bernadette calls the home of Kirsten Costas. Now her mother Beret answers and she does not identify herself, but simply tells her that there is a secret Bobble Links initiation dinner coming up the following evening and that she would be there to pick Kirsten up around 8.30 p.m. Now Kirsten was away at cheerleading camp and Bernadette knew this. And I believe that this is why she was able to get away with this because if she called and Kirsten answered, she may have been able to identify her and then and her plan would have went left. However, she tells her mother this and then she hangs up the payphone. So the following evening, Kirsten's parents and brother are leaving. Um, I believe there was something going on with the brother, some type of game or something. So they were out of the house. She calls the home and tells Kirsten she loves her and that she would see her later on that evening and to have a good time at this dinner. Now, Bernadette, who had no license, had told her parents that she had a babysitting job. Bernadette often babysat in order to uh, make money to do extracurricular activities. So this babysitting job was not far away from their home and her father had taken her. Now, once they got there, he had um, been persuaded by Bernadette to keep the car there. So Bernadette said, that she would feel a lot safer with the car in the driveway just in case uh, anyone was to drive by or anything, they would see a car there and would assume that there was an adult home. So then her father leaves the car with her and then he walks the short distance back home. Around 8.30 p.m., 
Bernadette shows up to Kirsten's home as planned. She honks the horn and when Kirsten comes out, she is a little disappointed to see that it is Bernadette, but she's like, okay, whatever. And Bernadette tells her, look, there is no Baba Links dinner um, tonight. I just said that so that we could go to this unsupervised party. Like it's gonna be cool, it's gonna be awesome. And she persuades Kirsten to get into the car with her. So as they're driving, they end up pulling into this church parking lot. Now, according to Bernadette, she says that she pulled into the church parking lot because Kirsten wanted to smoke before they got to the party. She wanted to get high. At one point, they had been sitting there 30, 40 minutes and Kirsten had offered Bernadette to smoke weed with her. Bernadette had refused. And according to Bernadette, that is when they kind of got into this little altercation. According to Bernadette, she said that Kirsten made her feel like a lame for not smoking. But later on, friends would state that they didn't think that that was true because Bernadette would literally do anything to be accepted, especially by Kirsten. So then Kirsten asked about this party and she felt like, you know what, I don't want to go. Like, you're really weird. Like, who does this? This is just too much. So Bernadette starts crying and asking Kirsten, like, why is she being so mean to her? Why doesn't she like her? She just wants to be her friend. So Kirsten ends up getting out of the car and walking to a family friend's home, Mary Jane and Alexander. So she knocks on the door and she asks if she can call her parents because she is out with a friend and the friend is all weird. And so she calls her home, no one answers, and she then realizes that her family has not returned home yet and then asks the family if... Uh, they can take her home. So the father, Alexander, does take Kirsten home. That Alexander is driving Kirsten home. He realizes that Bernadette is following pretty closely behind. Now, he said that she didn't seem really concerned about it. She said that she was okay, but she just did not want to be with her that night or have her take her home because she was being weird. According to... Uh, Bernadette when Kirsten at first went into the home uh, of Alexander and Mary Jane she just like got really angry and she just thought like oh man she's gonna start telling other people like this interaction that we had so as she was in the home with them talking as she got into the car with Alexander she just became increasingly angry. So once they pulled up to the house, Alexander stayed in the car to ensure that Kirsten would get inside. But instead of going inside, she did not want to be home alone. And so she started heading towards her neighbor's house. About that time, Bernadette grabs a knife out of the out of her car, an 18 inch knife, and heads towards Kirsten. So Kirsten is yelling like, just stay away from me, just go. And Alexander is in his car at the street, making sure that Kirsten gets in. But then when Bernadette runs up to her, he's, all he sees is an altercation. He just feels like this is a fist fight. He does not know that anyone is being stabbed. Bernadette then stabs Kirsten twice in her stomach and then once in her hand as she's trying to block the knife. And then she falls to the ground and Bernadette stabs her two more times, and then takes off back to her car. So Alexander then tries to go after Bernadette, but then realizes that like, hey, you know, Kirsten needs help. And then he goes back to where Kirsten is. So Kirsten, who has now been stabbed, had managed somehow to get to her feet and she went to her neighbor's house, whose name is Arthur Hillman. Once he opened the door, she literally fell out into his arms. So he had told his son to call 911 and he's constantly like repeatedly asking her who did this, who did this, who did this. But all Kirsten could respond with is saying that she couldn't breathe. So Kirsten's family did arrive at their home as she was being loaded into the ambulance and taken to the hospital. So Alexander had told the police that the only thing he remembered was this weird friend that she was talking about, that she was with, and that she had had like a, a chunky face and kind of like stringy hair, and that she was driving a Ford Pinto. 
Bernadette had arrived back home a little after 10 p.m. and she was just really waiting around for police to arrive because she knew that Kirsten was going to tell the police that it was her that had stabbed her. So when police didn't arrive, she had went on a walk with her mother as if nothing had ever happened. By 11 p.m. that evening, 15-year-old Kirsten Costas was pronounced dead. One of the stab wounds had hit a major artery in her heart. So a lot of people did pay respects uh, and came to the funeral of Kirsten Costas, including Bernadette. So as police are interviewing students and everything, they do come across Bernadette. They do end up giving her a polygraph test, which comes back inconclusive. And then also the babysitting job that she allegedly had that evening could not be verified, but she was not arrested. So now it was a new year at school. And what Bernadette did not know is that the FBI um, had been requested to do a profile on the person that they believed had killed Kirsten. So then this profile arrives in October of 1984 and it points to Bernadette. So she is brought back in for questioning. And after describing this person, it's gonna be someone that was close to Kirsten, uh, someone who may not fit in. Um, they asked her, who does this sound like? And Bernadette says that it sounds like her. So she's not arrested, she doesn't confess, and they believe that it is her. And they just kind of sit back hoping that she will come forth with the information. So in December, she had attempted to talk to her mother. Her mother kind of told her that she was really tired and didn't want to talk. And so uh, one morning before school, she writes a letter to her parents confessing to the murder. But she tells them to not read it until 30 minutes after she leaves. In the letter, she confesses to killing Kirsten and says that she was able to live with the fact that she killed Kirsten, but couldn't ignore it. So in this letter, she had begged her parents to never stop loving her and talked about how she had felt inferior and less than Kirsten and asked her parents to not ask her why she did it because she didn't know. As soon as she had read this letter, her mother uh, booked it to the high school, picked up her daughter Bernadette, and then went to the police station where Bernadette did confess to the murder of Kirsten. The prosecutor did try to prove that this was premeditated, that Bernadette did plan this. Um, however, they did not convict her of first degree murder, but on April 1st, April Fool's Day, 1985, she was convicted of second degree murder and sentenced to the maximum, which was nine years in prison. So Bernadette was sent to the California Youth Authority and she had received her GED at this facility. And after seven years on June 10th, 1992, she was um, paroled. The family of Kirsten was obviously disgusted by this. There was such a, um, a it was such a short sentence to begin with. And then for her not to even complete the nine years, they had ultimately moved to Hawaii once Bernadette was released at the age of 23. She then changed her name. She did get married and have children and her whereabouts today are unknown.